Good afternoon. It's, it's wonderful to see so many of you here. My name is Elizabeth Sackler, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to a program which has been organized by the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. As many of you know, uh, the center opened in March of 2007. We are an exhibition space and an education center dedicated to feminist art. Our mission is to raise awareness of feminism's cultural contributions, to educate new generations, and I'm happy we have all generations here and we have continued to have, uh, about the meaning of feminist art and to maintain a dynamic learning facility uh, presenting discussions and panelists on feminist act activism and on art itself. The center has hosted scores of outstanding lectures and panel discussions throughout 2008. And uh, this today is my final wild card for the year. And uh, I, I put out an invitation to the most fabulous feminist of all, Gloria Steinem. <laughs> and she is uh, today moderating her, po her panel entitled Sex Trafficking and the New Abolitionists. The slide uh, behind me ran on the front page, you may have seen it, of December 9th's international section. And uh, as you can see, if you can read the bottom, financial crisis tames demand for world's oldest service. Uh, obviously, they didn't have room for the world's uh, oldest profession, so somebody came up with service, equally offensive. I dare say part of what caught me about it, other than what it is about, and it is a full half page, uh, six full columns uh, in, in that section of the, of the front page, um, is that the photograph, that is a photograph, reminded me it's reminiscent of an Edward Hopper painting. And I don't think that is an unimportant uh, point. And uh, the final quote in this very long article is from the club's marketing director, Suzanne Brezinov, and she said, people have less money, but hard times also mean that people want to be cheered up. Well, I thought it could be worse. It could have been in the business section. <laughs> but this is how the press handles what Gloria Steinem's first sentence in the foreword to Sage and Caston's 2006 book entitled Enslaved, which is on sale at the uh, um, museum's bookstore, by the way, and it's wonderful. Gloria wrote, in the long struggle against the idea that one human being can own another, we have reached a dangerous stage, a time of believing that slavery is over. There is, there always has been, but there is now a global war being waged against women, as simultaneously there are some of us arguing about whether or not we have and live in a post-feminist world. It is a war whose atrocities range from distasteful to horrifying, a war that is ignored a war that is accepted and or profiting governments, organizations, and individuals. Millions of women and children are held as sex slaves around the world. Torturous violence against women in war is now status quo. Rape camps did not only exist and do not only exist in Bosnia. The sale of children, predominantly girls, but boys as well, as young as seven and eight, into brothels is an accepted cultural norm in all too many countries. Kathy Austin, who is an expert in arms trafficking, just returned from the Congo, and she observed that it is more dangerous to be a woman there than to be a soldier. Rape, she said, is the poor man's B-54 bomber and sex trafficking is second only to arms trafficking today. A numbness has come to surround issues of violence against women, also a breakdown in the rule of law. Rape was identified as a war crime 
1907. In 1926, the Geneva Convention on Slavery recognized enslavement and particularly, even at that time, the trafficking of women and children as crimes against humanity. That is 82 years ago, and here we are. Today, criminal and humanitarian law expert Patricia Sellers posits all gender crimes, rape, sex trafficking, sale of children, to be crimes against humanity. Enslavement of women is global, highly organized, as I think we will hear, and I believe, at this point, epidemic in proportions. Gloria Steinem is now giving voice to begin a war against the war being waged upon us. And whether young or old, woman or man, these horrors and abuses scar our humanity. Gloria's guests for today's discussion are Tiana Bienami, beautiful name, who is the executive director of Equality Now, an international human rights organization that works for the protection of the rights of women and girls. Issues of concern to Equality Now include rape, domestic violence, female genital mutilation, reproductive rights, trafficking in women and other forms of violence and discrimination that affect women and girls every day. Tiana holds a JD from NYU School of Law and a licence, is that correct? That's wonderful, licence in political science from the University de Genève and the Graduate School of International Studies in Switzerland. Tiana has contributing essays in the 2006 Becoming Myself, Reflections on Growing Up Female, edited by Willa Shallot, and When You Need a Lift, Two Cups of Comfort and Support from Joy and Bahar and Friends, 2007. Tiana is also a contributing editor, um, a contributor uh, to the Huffington Post. Our second panelist today is Rachel Lloyd, who is the founder and executive director of Girls Education and Mentoring Service, acronym GEMS. GEMS is the only nonprofit in New York State serving domestically trafficked youth and commercially sexually exploited girls and young women. Under Ms. Lloyd's leadership, GEMS annually serves 250 girls through its direct services and 1,000 youth through education and outreach. Ms. Lloyd is a nationally recognized advocate and expert on the issue of commercial sexual exploitation of children, actively involved in the effort to pass legislation to protect this population. She speaks uh, at events and conferences across the country, and she's been honored with the Reebok Human Rights Award and the Frederick Douglass Award from the North Star Fund, among others. She received her bachelor's in psychology from Marymount Manhattan College and her master's in applied urban anthropology from the city of New York. I must uh, tell you that um, she has been caught in uh, uh, traffic and will be joining us uh, a little bit later, but we are going to begin and she will join us shortly. It is also a privilege and an honor to introduce Gloria Steinem. And it is always an interesting dilemma as to how to introduce Gloria Steinem. An icon, a national treasure, or for those of you who are the millennia generation, and I had so much fun doing this and it took one second this morning, a woman whose name pulls up on Google 609,000 hits in 14 one, ten, one hundredths of a second. <laughs> Though many say Gloria needs no introduction, I want to take a moment to highlight some of her important accomplishments because they are the backbone of the women's revolution and because I think, and I'm sure you do too, that she is awesome. Gloria Steinem travels widely as a feminist activist, organizer, writer, and lecturer. Her books include the bestsellers, Revolution from Within, A Book of Self-Esteem, Outrageous Acts and Everyday Rebellions, my favorite, Moving Beyond Words, and Marilyn Norma Jean on the life of Marilyn Monroe. She was editor of the Reader's Companion to U.S. Women's History, co-founded New York Magazine and Ms. Magazine, where she continues to serve as a consulting editor. 
She has been published in many magazines, as we all know, in newspapers here and in other countries, and is also a frequent guest, excuse me, commentator on radio and television. She helped to found the Women's Action Alliance, the National Women's Political Caucus, and Choice USA. She was the founding president of the Ms. Foundation for Women and helped create Take Our Daughters to Work Day. She had served on the Board of Trustees of Smith College and was a member of Beyond Racism Initiative, a comparative study of racial patterns in the US, South Africa, and Brazil. She has also co-produced a documentary on child abuse for HBO and a feature film for Lifetime. She received the Penny Missouri Journalism Award, the Front Page and Clarion Awards, National Magazine Awards, and Emmy Citation for Excellence in Television Writing, the Women's Sports Journalism Award, the Lifetime Achievement in Journalism Award from the Society of Professional Journalists. Oh, I'm sorry, I lost track. The University of Missouri of Journalism, I know. She says, no more, too much, cut, 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 cut. It is our good fortune, indeed, to spend the next two hours with these three extraordinary women discussing a topic that affects us all. Please join me in warm and welcome enthusiasm for Gloria Steinem. This is Liz being generous and disguising the fact that the reason we're here is because of Liz. <laughs> she, <laughs> she took the already great populist tradition of the Brooklyn Museum and widened it to include feminist artists not just from this country, but from all over the world. And she understood how important it is that we come together in the same space, not just our work, but our whole physical selves. Some of you who were here for the opening of the center will remember that she insisted on having the artists come, not just their art. How revolutionary is that? And so they got to meet each other and do presentations to each other. And with that kind of understanding, she also has created this space where the museum can, as she says, be a launching pad for the future and where we can uh, discuss and actually see each other. Now, I'm all in favor of the web, but it happens that we have reflector cells in our brains that allow us to empathize, understand, you know, many hundreds of times more when we are in the same space together. So my hope is that today, I mean, I know that there are people here who might be uh, understandably hearing about this international global trade in human beings for the very first time because it receives uh, ambiguous or invisible kinds of coverage. There are those of you who know very much about it, and I know that all of us want to do something about it. So my hope is that each of us might leave here with a new fact, a new understanding, and a new way of actually practically combating this in our neighborhoods, in our own countries, uh, in our foreign policy, in the kinds of legislation we lobby for, in many, many, many uh, different ways. Uh, because uh, it always seems to me that a person who has experienced something is more expert in it than the experts. I'm especially grateful that Rachel Lloyd is going to be with us. This has been part of her life experience and she has uh, come to the final stage of healing, which is using what happened to us to help someone else. And she has also uh, given us a film. So I'd like you to see the first 10 minutes of the film and then we will discuss and we will also take your uh, questions and your comments and your subversive organizing ideas. <laughs> uh, but this uh, film uh, is uh, about very young girls. The average, yes, the average age of entry into the commercial sex industry in this country is 13. 
This uh, uncompromising but strikingly warm-hearted documentary gives a forceful voice to the voiceless, to those women who have been tricked, seduced, neglected, or abandoned, and so have ended up selling themselves for sex from a very, very young age. We will see the film, then hopefully the fiery campaigner that created it will be with us too. Thank you. I, I'm glad we started with this bit of footage because it shows us the human way, one of countless ways that people are brought into this sex trade. We, we think of it, first of all, when we think about sex trafficking, mainly is international. And of course, it is a huge global trade that rivals the arms and the drug trade. Um, but it's also important that we understand that it is happening in the, just as it goes from poor areas of the world to rich parts of the world, it goes from poor parts of this country to rich parts of this country. I first became aware <coughs> of this with what is called the Minnesota Pipeline, which uh, was so common that it was named by the NYPD, the New York Police, the Minnesota Pipeline, because it consisted of young women from uh, farms in Minnesota uh, who were often of Scandinavian heritage and so were blonde and blue-eyed and in this also racist structure had more commercial value, who were brought into the sex trade in this way by boyfriends or by offers of jobs in New York and so on and ended up uh, in the Times Square area, sometimes chained by the ankle to a bed, sometimes walking the streets free, depending on the state of their rebellion, often tamed by drugs, uh, as, as part of, of, this, of this trade. Uh, of course, it happens over the border, as, as you know. Uh, a lot of the immigration problem that we hear about is unwilling. We don't hear about the unwilling immigrants who are brought in from Mexico or brought in from uh, the Ukraine, from the Estans, from all kinds of, of countries, hoping for being promised a job and ending up in, in, in this kind of sex trade. <coughs> um, the, the net result of this overall from, from and I brought along this, uh, an atlas that, that shows in a, in a map the kind of worldwide patterns, and I'd be glad to leave this on the apron of the stage if you want to look at it, of the, uh, of the trade from poor areas of the world into more well-to-do areas of the world. There is millions and millions of people, and indeed at this stage in history, uh, there are more uh, enslaved people than there were in the 1800s. Uh, it's much easier to transport people. People are continuing sources of income. Drugs are used up. Arms are used up. People last some, somewhat longer. So it is, it is uh, more, more profitable, in fact. Um, there are differences. There are the, the, the slave trade of the 1800s was about 60% uh, adult males and about 40% uh, women and a few children. Uh, this uh, enslaved trade uh, is about 85% women and children because it is so heavily uh, the sex trade and then uh, labor, enslaved labor as, as well. It, it is um, the subject of legislation, which Taina can uh, explain. I mean, we, you know, there are, there, there are laws against this in almost every country in the world, which is ahead of the state of the abolitionists of the 1800s who had to get laws uh, against, um, against the slave trade. It has similarities because uh, it is regarded, as you noted in the New York Times headline, as inevitable in the same way that slavery in the 1800s was regarded as inevitable and enshrined in the Bible and talked about as, uh, as uh, natural or as a normal uh, part of, of the need for labor, uh, and indeed then as, um, uh, as <laughs> a need for 
uh, protection for people who could not protect themselves. The idea was that slaves, enslaved people, could not fend for themselves. So in those days, we had slave narratives, which were very, very important in demonstrating that enslaved people were human beings. And those stories were terribly, terribly important. And today, we need those stories again. We know that the enslaved individuals are human beings, but we don't necessarily know that the enslavement is taking place, or how big it is, or that it can be in our own neighborhoods. One of the uh, <coughs> tracks is bringing people in over the Mexican border from a wide variety of countries, not just from Mexico, uh, bringing them uh, eastward as, and using them along the way in uh, truck stops for prostitutes for truck drivers. And it is possible to buy on the internet a, a child or a female and collect them at a house in New Jersey. This was the subject of a New York Times Sunday Magazine expose of a few years ago. Uh, which was made into a very good film, which I, very exact kind of film, a feature film, but very uh, like a documentary, called Trade, uh, that you might want to get and show to the groups with, with which you, you, you are, are active. Um, however, I want to say one other thing because we need to guard against hopelessness, and that is that the New York Times was wrong when they said it's the world's oldest profession, or the world's old, oldest trade, or whatever. They said it's not true. There are many, many, many examples of societies that don't have prostitution, and indeed, the oldest societies were the least likely to have prostitution. Lately, I've been reading the accounts of the colonists who came to this country, and were shocked to discover that as they put it, even these savages don't rape, not even their uh, prisoners, not even their female prisoners. It's a function of a power imbalance. And in the societies that existed for 95% of human history, as far as we know, there was a far greater balance between males and females as between people and nature. Uh, so it is, it has not, it has not been true universally in, in, all, in all human societies. And also, it is not <coughs> true that all men uh, need to have the kind of control and dominance that comes with uh, the demand for prostitution, whether, whether women or children. I think it's, it's very important that we say this because, you know, if we give statistics, like uh, one in three or four U.S. women will be sexually assaulted in our lifetime. It makes it sound as if one in three or four men uh, has, is sexually assaulting. That's just not true. The average rapist has raped 14 women. And I even though it is far too normalized, the whole idea of purchasing, a, of a body invasion, of purchasing another person, of dominating another person for sex. It's far too normalized, and there are far too many uh, fathers who initiate their sons into sexuality by, whether the sons want to do this or not, by taking them you know, to uh, a brothel. <clears throat> Nonetheless, it, it is a, it is, we have no evidence that it is uh, inevitable in any way, and much evidence that it is not, and that when there is a power balance, uh, when there is not an idea of masculinity that is a cult of masculinity that requires uh, control and dominance, that uh, this diminishes and diminishes. And that's why it's so important that we address the demand. Um, I was hoping that Rachel would be here if I vamp till ready. She's not, <laughs> she's not here yet. Soon. But I, I would like to ask uh, Taina to t tell us, if you can, briefly, how you first became aware of this reality of life that is hidden in plain sight 
uh, and uh, <clears throat> how, how you regard the stage we are in now in terms of recognizing it, uh, achieving legislation, achieving remedies. Um, well, I came through it, I guess, through various entry points, as many of us go through, uh, through journeys in life, through various entry points. Um, when I was in, uh, at the university, one of my housemates was a beautiful young woman who was, um, she was biracial, I guess her father was of African descent and uh, had been raped at the age of 10 and was, uh, was studying and needed money. And so she thought that it wouldn't be so bad to start selling her body. And this was in, in, in Geneva, in Switzerland, where um, the standard of living is extremely high. So her clientele was basically um, judges, lawyers, businessmen. And, um, you know, we were all, we were a house of feminists, and we, at that point, I think, there was still the debate, just as, just as there is a debate now as to what is consent and can you sell your body, how harmful that is, et cetera, et cetera. So we just accepted her, her quote-unquote choice. Um, but then increasingly, her behavior changed. She started buying a number of um, sex toys that were, that were inducive to violence, like whips and uh, cigarettes, and she would, she would tell us what her, her johns, her clients, would want, how they would want to be stepped on, and in great detail, you know, so she would purchase stiletto shoes, etc. But the most concerning part is she, uh, her soul was dying, and we could actually see her dying. I mean, her, she wouldn't look us in the eye anymore, and she uh, was very withdrawn and stopped going to classes. And eventually, we, we lost sight of her. She left the house, and, um, and some of us were trying to find out where she went. And so we, we realized the, the extreme damage that, um, that she was actually being subjected to, but also that it was, it was a direct result, probably, of the injury she had suffered as a child. And if you look at the research, um, particularly if you look at Dr. Melissa Farley's research, um, Education, Prostitution, and Research is her website, there's a high percentage, 89 to 94 percent of women in prostitution have been sexually abused at some point in their lives, most likely as children. And then I guess the, the second entry point was when I uh, met Jessica Newworth, um, when we were both at uh, a Wall Street law firm in, in uh, the early 90s. And Jessica had arrived from Amnesty after being many, many years at Amnesty International and feeling increasingly frustrated at the fact that uh, and I don't want to single out Amnesty, but most human, mainstream human rights organizations did not consider abuses that happen to women because they are born female as human rights abuses. And even me, having come from a feminist background and not a human rights background, really perceived human rights violations as political prisoners or um, or um, people who had, whose rights had been violated because of free speech, et cetera, but you never really thought of, of uh, rape or domestic violence as uh, under the context of, of human rights. So she was thinking of starting an organization. She didn't know what to call it, and that's how Equality Now was born, um, where, and happily now, 20 years later, women's rights as human rights is an accepted concept that although sometimes <laughs> within the halls of the UN you, you still have to debate that, unfortunately, and even more so now with the fundamentalisms um, growing, but that's another uh, subject of, uh, of conversation. Um, and so in the early 90s, once Equality Now started, obviously trafficking was, was a, always a, a serious um, issue, but it was, it was burgeoning. I, I don't think it, it had reached the... the um, <clears throat> the scourge or, or the attention or even the, the magnitude of the problem that, that it is now. Um, Business Week um, had published an article in 93 on sex tour operators. 
and said that there were 25 sex tour operators in the United States, and this was pre-internet. Um, one of those sex tour operators was Big Apple Oriental Tours right here in Queens, and so uh, we worked with a, a male lawyer, Ken Frensblau, who sent in his $3 for some information about Big Apple Oriental Tour, and they sent a video and informational brochures, and uh, you looked at the materials and it really left nothing to, ima to the imagination. These tours specifically um, arranged for trips for men for $2,000. You could go to the Philippines or Cambodia or Thailand for seven days and seven nights. Uh, their tagline was real sex for real cheap with real girls. And they even um, sent him a, a list of, of referrals of men who had not only been on the trip, but had such a wonderful time that they were willing to share great details of, of their trip. And in fact, he spoke with a number of men who explained how the process worked. Once you arrived at the airport, somebody would uh, meet you there, teach you how to um, negotiate the bar fines, et cetera, et cetera, which hotels to go to, which bars to go to, et cetera. So what we did with that is uh, we gathered all the evidence and we went to the Queens District Attorney's Office and said, this is clearly in violation of New York penal law that prohibits profiting from prostitution or soliciting prostitution. And it went nowhere. For seven years it went absolutely nowhere. The Queens DA's office said, not our problem. Um, this is, you know, it happens elsewhere. These women probably uh, have consented to this. And so, ironically, it was, it was only after Elliot Spitzer was re-elected as Attorney General, <laughs> you laugh, but this is just even the beginning, that he actually uh, investigated Big Apple Oriental Tours and a year after that shut it down, which was the first civil action of its kind in the country, and it and effectively shut down the website and the business of the Big Apple Oriental Tour. Now, we also wanted um, the owner-operators of Big Apple Oriental Tour to be um, criminally indicted. And now the campaign is in its uh, 13th year, I guess, and there's a, finally a criminal trial um, that is going forward in, in February. But all that to say is that um, here, we, um, here we were trying to alert uh, this violation to, to law enforcement and they were really, really not, not interested at all. So uh, the, the other point that I, um, that I wanted to add is when we look at the, uh, the market of human trafficking, and again, People are trafficked both for labor and for sexual servitude. As Gloria mentioned, the majority of people who are uh, trafficked into sexual servitude are women um, and, and, and children. Um, and so there's a lot of debate on, on what we call the supply side, because it is a market. You have the supply side and you have the demand side. So a lot of focus has been given on the supply side. Who are these women? Did they consent to being trafficked? Uh, what kind of documents do they have? Are they illegal immigrants? Should they be deported, et cetera? But very, very little attention until, until most recently was focused on the demand side. Who are the actors? What are the elements that are contributing to this multi-billion dollar industry? And that's why Equality Now focused on sex tourism uh, because human trafficking is such a complex, complex crime. It involves uh, organized crime sometimes, it involves corruption of government, um, and so what does a small human rights organization do uh, when, when you are faced with such enormous challenges? So focusing on the demand and also focusing on legislation I think has been one of our two main uh, Main, main focuses and mm -hmm. so we, we have seen incremental uh, successes without a doubt. I mean just the fact that we are talking about it, you know, breaking the silence as we know is always the first step um, in, um, in addressing issues of, of violence and discrimination against women and I think that silence is broken and now we are really trying to grapple as a community both national and international as how to address the situation in an effective way. Mm -hmm. But, the, but one, one final point is um, we can't look at sex trafficking in a vacuum. 
it is, it is along the spectrum of violence and discrimination against women and girls. Women are trafficked for sex because they are female, and even the men who are trafficked for sex uh, are, traf are trafficked because of their, of their gender. In other words, they cater mostly to men, and so you're also looking at a gender equality situation. Um, and I think that's where, where we, we need to develop the, the, uh, the discourse right now, is that a number of human rights activists with incredible in intentions really try to carve out the commercial sexual exploitation of women outside of the spectrum of violence and discrimination. And we have to bring that element back into the discussion mm -hmm. of gender inequality. Yes, I, I think that we have a definitional problem sometimes because what happens to men is political and what happens to women is cultural. And the, there's a sort of feeling, well, you can't change that, that's, that's culture. And that difficulty has <coughs> been with us in uh, many different areas of, of activism um, and perhaps especially this one. I think we, we have been fairly successful in demonstrating that rape is not sex, it's violence. Uh, we have not been at all successful, in my opinion, in demonstrating that uh, pornography is violence, erotica is sex, you know, because porne means female slavery. It is a m material about uh, the enslavement of women or men acting as, as women. And we are still, um, excuse me, we are, <clears throat> we are still quite far behind in uh, the understanding that prostitution doesn't happen everywhere, what really happens in prostitution or uh, for that matter in, in rape in New York State, most, in most rapes there is not, as they euphemistically say, a completed sex act. There is uh, sex uh, with violence, with uh, objects used, and and so on. So you know this is uh, a a very important time when each of us, in talking to our networks and uh, whatever groups we are in touch with, can begin to uh, highlight what is really happening, as opposed to the myth of of what's happening. And I think the, um, the idea of, of blaming the victim uh, is very much embedded in the law. So we find that the prostitute is arrested, uh, the pimp frequently is not, or the trafficker frequently is not, and the customer is almost never penalized. So there's this kind of false dichotomy between is it legal or illegal, when uh, the groups that are trying to provide alternatives around the world and are working most effectively, it seems to me, uh, are probably trying to get services for the women and children, not to, to decriminalize the women and children uh, so that they actually do get services, to criminalize the, the pimps and the traffickers so they really do get punishment and to uh, try to figure out how to stem the demand side. You know, what is it that uh, causes um, some men to get hooked, really, to get addicted, to need this, this uh, domination? So do you, Taina, you know so much about the state of remedies and the laws in different countries. What has successful, <coughs> what works, and what doesn't? Could you help us to understand the state of the, uh, of the legal progress? Um, okay, uh, where to start? Um, the model law that we always quote is the law in Sweden, where in 1999, Sweden recognized that uh, prostitution and commercial sexual exploitation of women was really a form of gender inequality that needs to be addressed as a society. So they have a law uh, whereby only the demand side is prosecuted. And the women, and I'm saying women for shorthand because most of the people in prostitution are women, um, are not. 
uh, what has that, unfortunately no report has come out. We only have anecdotal report from the government of Sweden saying that there's been a reduction in prostitution of 25% and certainly trafficking uh, into Sweden has significantly been reduced. Actually Interpol intercepted conversations uh, amongst traffickers saying, no need to go into Sweden, don't bother, it's going to be too costly to do business, they have this law, um, why don't we go to the surrounding countries? And it is true that the surrounding countries have seen an exponential increase in, in trafficking. Norway just passed the similar law that Sweden has, as well as uh, um, South Korea and Nepal. Um, and hopefully the UK also may, may come out with, with a law they're debating right now. Now the other spectrum of, of the law uh, that has the opposite effect in, in, in our view would be the situation of the Netherlands and Germany, certain states in Australia, New Zealand, where prostitution is legalized. And when we say prostitution is legalized, we mean it's the industry of the sex trade that is legalized. It gives you a, uh, is that Rachel? Yeah. Yay! <laughs> you made it. <coughs> um, so when you, when you give a green light to the sex industry, what it does, it creates a very, um, uh, it flour demand flourishes, in other words. It increases the demand. So if you look at Netherlands, 80% of the women in prostitution in Amsterdam are from outside of, of the Netherlands. Now the people who are generally pro-legalization of prostitution um, believed that uh, you legalize it because you, you, you can regulate it. Then the state has a, a stake in making uh, the sex trade safer, so to speak. But in fact, uh, the, the sex trade is inherently violent and demeaning and, and degrading, and you cannot separate uh, the legal brothels from the illegal brothels. Um, Gloria, you just came back from Nevada where there are legal brothels that are basically like concentration camps where you have barbed wires around the, the premises, women are not free to leave the premises. Um, so the, the model we think that is really a, a model that, that can help women in the sex trade is a model whereby they are not criminalized but you cannot uh, legalize the, the industry of the sex trade. And by the industry, it's everyone from the traffickers to the procurers to the pimps all the way down, down to the johns. Mm -hmm. We are very, very far away from the Swedish model in this country, unfortunately. Um, I think that uh, there's still a lot of um, awareness that needs to be raised in, in, in this country about um, the, the sex trade and its dreadful impact on the lives of, of women and girls. Um, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000 was the first tool that we had at the federal level to address trafficking. Unfortunately, since 2000, there have only been 111 successful cases of sex trafficking that have been prosecuted in this country where the statistics indicate that anywhere between 14,000 and 17,000 people are trafficked into the US. So again, the disparity between the 111 and the thousands of people trafficked into this country is, is, is really uh, unacceptable. Um, as of yesterday or two days ago, the Wilberforce Act, which is a reauthorization of the uh, federal law, has uh, has passed. It, it was not the bill we wanted, but nevertheless it has some critical provisions that I, I think are incremental steps toward addressing the the issue of demand. So I think we are we are getting there. It's just going to take a lot of, uh, of awareness and I also think the survivors networks really need to be strengthened and I think this is where uh, Rachel can, can speak more about it because I think we, we th there are a number of grassroots groups not only in this country but around the world who are really getting stronger and building a national and international network um, to, to tell their stories and, and tell people how, um, how much the sex trade is actually a human rights violation that needs to end but, um, but I think that will take some time. But. 
Yeah, you made it. Yes, Rachel, <laughs> thank you for the... <laughs> thank you for the film, and I hate to make you sit down and speak right away, but we, 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 need, we need you so that we can then uh, open up the, the discussion. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I started out by asking Taina a simple question, which becomes more complicated when I ask it of you, but I'll ask the same question, <laughs> which is, how did you become aware of, of the sex trade? What, were, what was your life experience that brought you into it, and how do you regard the current state of our progress in recognizing it? Um, I mean, my experience with the, with the commercial sex industry began probably initially in England. You can probably guess within about 30 seconds of me talking that I'm not a native New Yorker. Um, and so I grew up uh, actually outside of, about an hour outside of London in a place called Portsmouth, um, and began to get involved probably about 13, 14 years old um, in uh, some pornography, um, nude modeling, etc., in which you were able to do it when you were 13, 14 years old and people didn't ask questions and you were able to make money. Um, was kind of introduced to escort agencies, etc., but wasn't really kind of inducted into the sex industry until I was about 16, 17, which happened in Germany. And in Germany, uh, at, at that time, and obviously Germany has, has legalized in many areas um, the sex industry at that time. It was, you could legally work in a strip club, um, not under the age of 18, although most of us who were working in there were under the age of 18. We changed our, our passports. This was just after the wall had come down and there were, I would say again, most of us in, in the clubs um, weren't German, you know, there was Czechoslovakian girls and Russian girls and Croatian girls, I mean, from all over the place. Um, and so that was kind of my introduction to, to the commercial sex industry. Obviously, you know, I think there's a sense that when you're kind of, you know, as a survivor that you understand the industry. Um, you survive it, but that doesn't necessarily give you a context to kind of analyzing it. You're probably not sitting around analyzing how race and class and gender intersect in the sex industry <laughs> while you're trying to like run from your pimp or not get arrested or whatever. Um, <laughs> so it probably wasn't until kind of afterwards and I, I was you know, in recovery and had, had been out for a few years and was, was just kind of in a, a good and safe place in my life and decided that I wanted to come to the States. And I, originally I just wanted to work with young people. I mean, I wasn't particularly kind of trying to revisit that area and got a job working um, with an agency here that was working with adult women coming out of the sex industry and came out here and was still fairly in denial about what had happened in my experiences and began to work with, I think the first week I was out here, I went out to, to Rikers Island and for the very first time ever, I was in front of about 70, 80 women who were in a drug program, adult women. I was about 20, I was 22 when I came and they were all like, what's this little girl gonna tell us? And I got up and I told my story and it was the first time I'd ever actually done that and kind of acknowledged what had happened and the harm that had been done and, and in that space found women um, who had very similar experiences obviously and were incredibly embracing um, and felt hmm, maybe this is something that I'm going to kind of stick with. This is something that I do want to understand more. And so spent, you know, a couple of years really trying to learn about the issue and analyze the issue and, and analyze the role of survivors mm -hmm. in it. Um, and, and saw people like, you know, Norma Hitaling or Vanita Carter, um, who were survivors, Kelly Hill at that time, who were survivors who'd begun their own organizations and felt very, very strongly and, and just very compelled to, to kind of start my own, not really having a sense mm -hmm. of what running a nonprofit um, would look like. Um, and so after the first year of coming to the States, I started uh, GEMS, which is the organization. I'm not sure what clips you saw in the film. If you, I don't know if they had gone to GEMS yet, but GEMS is the only uh, nonprofit in New York State that works specifically with commercially sexually exploited and domestically trafficked uh, girls and young women. Um, and so obviously there is a, a very, very personal kind of passion there, um, but also a passion I think that has come not just from my own experiences and being able to identify, you know, you kind of see yourself in different girls, etc. But I mean, really, in just working with hundreds of young women over the years um, and seeing just the harm and the damage that's been done over and over again, and seeing these amazing, wonderful, resilient young women. Um, 
but for whom, you know, not only have they had these experiences in the sex industry, but kind of society has turned their back and, you know, families and communities and law enforcement and institutions and healthcare. And I mean, nowhere has kind of, you know, stepped up and said, this is something we need to intervene. And having, having said that, I mean, I, I've been doing this work now 11 years, um, came in August of 97, and so have seen a lot of progress. Um, you know, I, I think as advocates, right, we, we tend to be, you know, I don't know, half, half empty, half, you know, empty um, glass type people because you're always wanting something more. Um, but I will say, I mean, to hear, I mean, A, the fact that we have a panel and we have a full house. I mean, 10 years ago, you, you couldn't have done that. I mean, mm -hmm. you just, you couldn't have got 10 people in a room to talk about this issue. And, and if you did talk about it, you talked about it as, with children, you talked about these teen prostitutes who just had loose morals and, and trafficking. Well, that's something that happens, you know, I mean, I'm sure it happens to a couple of people in another country, but that's not anything. And demand, I mean, talking <coughs> about having a conversation about men's involvement in the sex industry and, and who's buying and, you know, I mean, that kind of conversation just wouldn't <coughs> have occurred um, a few years ago. Obviously, the TVPRA and, and you know, I'm excited The Explain when you say TVPRA. Sorry, explain. the Trafficking Victims Protection um, Reauthorization Act. It couldn't be any longer if it tried. Um, and now the, the Wilberforce, which would be much easier to say, um, in that reauthorization that did happen a couple of days ago. I mean, that's it's exciting. Um, again, it's not everything that we're looking for and it's not everything that we're pushing for um, but we have to kind of I think sometimes it's important to, to take a little step back and see some of the progress that's been made this year in New York State we saw I don't know if you, you've talked about this Tina but we've we saw the passage of the safe harbor for exploited youth act um, which was momentous it meant for the first time in the country we're the only state that has this legislation that young people who were arrested uh, for an act of prostitution would no longer be charged with an act of prostitution but would be considered a pins a person in need of supervision i.e. a child welfare issue as opposed to a juvenile justice issue um, this has been something that we've been fighting for for about four and a half years the fact that in our state and in many states that a child of 12 13 14 who cannot legally consent to sex could be arrested for an act of prostitution and charged with that and go to juvenile detention for a year, two years, three years um, was unconscionable. So the fact that, you know, the, the legislature finally made that move after four years and Governor Patterson finally signed it is a, is a huge step forward. Um, I could list all the things mm -hmm. that we haven't done and have yet to do and the way our media supports this and the way law enforcement still maybe doesn't quite get this and the lack of resources on the issue and the lack of attention to demand, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, we're beginning to see steps and I think, you know, it's important even in the, the one thing that probably won't slow down is the sex industry and that folks who were vulnerable and challenged by poverty before are gonna be even more vulnerable. Um, and so, I mean, I think, you know, we're gonna have to really continue to push and keep the momentum rolling over the next year or two in the face of people saying, well, we've got bigger issues to worry about. Well, obviously we, we have large challenges right now, but I do think that we have to, we have a level of momentum right now that if we could continue to stay focused, mm -hmm. we, could really, we could see real change, I think, on this issue. Well, I think we can see we have two poles here of, of progress and uh, need for much more progress. The very fact that this panel is called the New Abolitionist tells you that there are societies and groups, mainly of young people in Boston, in Las, you know, all over this country and other countries as well, who consider themselves New Abolitionists, which means that they understand that sex and labor trafficking is indeed uh, the current form of enslaving uh, men, women, and children, and it is economic, and it is wrong, and it, it can be remedied, and they are devoted to, to remedying this. At the, at the other end, as Rachel is, is saying about her experience in Germany, uh, is the legalizing of, not, not just decriminalizing the victims, but legalizing the entire industry uh, with the result that uh, you, you can be forced into sex work, otherwise you don't get unemployment benefits. I mean, the, I brought along a, a clipping from a German newspaper um, 
uh, that is called, if you don't take a job as a prostitute, we can stop your benefits. A 25-year-old waitress who turned down a job providing sexual services at a brothel in Berlin faces possible cuts in her unemployment benefit under laws introduced this year. Um, now, prostitution was legalized in Germany just over two years ago. This, was, this is from 2006. Uh, and brothel owners who must pay tax and employee health insurance were granted access to official databases of job seekers. The waitress, an unemployed information technology professional, had said that she was willing to work in a bar at night and had worked in a cafe. Uh, she received a letter from the job center, center telling her that an employer was interested in her profile. And the, you know, the bro in other words, the brothel owners can recruit at the unemployment centers, and you, you know, so this, this, uh, the, an end was put to this by mm -hmm. by uh, gr great demonstrations, even though it is, of course, still illegal. And this actually was my first experience, uh, even uh, before the Minnesota Pipeline. The National Welfare Rights Organization. I bet there are people here who know this organization. Uh, in the early 70s demonstrated in Las Vegas because women who were on welfare were being forced off welfare and into prostitution because they're, they're, the, the relevant members of the state government saw this as a win-win situation. They could create a tourist attraction and diminish their expense of welfare payments. And we all went and marched up and down uh, on the on the strip in front of the in, uh, in front of the Mustang Ranch, uh, you know, I remember thinking to myself, I didn't know that my life was going to bring me to marching up and down in front of the Mustang Ranch, <laughs> right. uh, and it was successfully stopped. But in order to uh, uh, see what the current situation is, I went back, as Taina mentioned, just before the election to Las Vegas and sat for a few days to interview women who were working there. And I thought I knew, you know, from these uh, 35 years of learning, but I didn't, in fact, what, how systematized it truly is in a place Lies like Las Vegas. In theory, as you know, prostitution is not illegal. It's not legal in Las Vegas, but is in a county that's some distance from Las Vegas. Of course, prostitution is everywhere uh, in, in Las Vegas. Uh, and the big influx is 11 to 14 year old girls, the police said. Um, the, the, it's quite systematized, you, you know, you, you work as a waitress, then your salary is cut, you are told that you could earn more if you were dancing in a topless bar, uh, then you find out, and here's the part I didn't know, that the women who dance in topless bars have to pay for the privilege of working there and uh, getting tips, but then kick back half their tips, have to also pay the bartender, the bouncer, and the, uh, pr the guy who plays the music, that it really is prostitution in lap dancing rooms. I th had this vision left over from television that somehow people were clothed, fully clothed, and, and the lap dancing situation wrong. There are benches in there. You know, what, whatever the customer wants is really what happens. Uh, and um, it's not just about penetration of a sexual sort as we would think, but penetration with bottles and with objects and so on. The women really don't like to go into that room. The, you know, I asked the young woman, one young woman I was interviewing, wh what money she had left with the night before, and she said $10. And she was in you know, a, a good, relatively good situation because she was living outside of this, uh, of this establishment. She was still living at home trying to finish high school. Uh, where it is legal, uh, it is, as Taina said, in uh, establishments surrounded by barbed wire in the desert, you know, say 10 or 20 miles from the nearest uh, building of any sort. The women are partly controlled by just having no other clothing, not having cars. Um, I went to, uh, an establishment of a couple of miles away, a saloon run by a woman who said, oh yes, she said, I feel sorry for those girls. I throw food over the fence to them. 
because they are, uh, and she said, I figured out how to do it. Uh, the guy who runs the brothel, who has been indicted by the FBI and never for bribery, but never prosecuted, uh, goes uh, to um, purchase food, there's noodles, you know, those kind of round things of noodles. He buys them by the uh, case. He, uh, for a dollar a piece, he charges the girls five dollars a piece. Raymond, I think they're called. And she figured that out, and so she buys the same thing, so she, he won't know that she's throwing food over the fence. So these women have more food. I mean, I just tell you, I don't want to, you know, I realize this level of detail would not be acceptable in an academic study, but I think it's important <clears throat> that we understand what, what the real life human situations are. Uh, and uh, um, <clears throat> what, what, you know, the, what the argument about legalization versus non-legalization leaves out. First of all, it creates a, a false polarization. It doesn't talk about decriminalizing the women and giving them services, which clearly should happen. It doesn't uh, talk about the demand. It really is, ends up uh, legalizing uh, the, the industry. Um, but I say, I say all this partly because every time I think each one of us has had this experience, every time we have this discussion, so someone in, some people present on a radio show, the listeners, whoever it is, will realize that they have seen something uh, that really was in fact suspicious and they didn't quite have the courage to say something about it or to reach out to the woman or the child concerned uh, or to question what's going on. So at, um, at I think the consciousness is always the first step to revolution uh, and action always follows consciousness. Are there um, questions, comments you would like to share? I believe we have someone here with a Mike, who will, I'm going to let her s select by her uh, proximity and ability to run around, which, which hand uh, to attend to first. But please feel free not just to ask questions, but to give us answers. Well, first of all, um, you have three generations here, uh, my mother and my two daughters, and it's incredible to see such role models who have um, taken their power and their consciousness and, and, and brought it to, uh, can, to other can, women. Can I just ask, can you hear? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Why don't you stand so uh, people sure. can also see you? Yeah. Sure. Hi. Um, my question, I uh, hope it's not out of context um, or inappropriate, is what impact, and I'll posit, you know, damage to this consciousness and this argument and this um, consciousness raising, something like uh, Elliot Spitzer's experience? Uh, have. Um, I, I'd really be interested mm -hmm. in, in your view on that. Well, I, I think, um, I mean, we felt it very painfully because uh, Elliot Spitzer's experience, because he had been very supportive and he was uh, helpful in prosecuting the sex tour agency that Taina was discussing. So I, it, it seems to me there is a difference between a person who is uh, committing a crime and trying to further it and someone who is committing a crime and trying to help society eliminate it. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, I the but the press coverage, yes. The press coverage I thought was very, very... Uh, deceptive because it gave the idea by focusing on the amount of money involved that the woman in question was getting that amount of money when I'm sure she was receiving only a small fraction, one, and two, it didn't get until much later on to the f kind of childhood she had had which sounded as if it made her feel as if she had no choice that she only had a sexual value. Yes, it made her it made her seem empowered, right. 
Do well, you want to address? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say as a survivor, aside from being an advocate, that week was incredibly frustrating and difficult. Um, the, I, I mean, the media coverage was incessant. Our phone kind of rang off the hook, and we had to have lots of conversations um, with the girls, you know, processing that. And, and I mean, I think for us, right, there wasn't necessarily a sense of surprise um, that Spitzer could, I'm being frank, that Spitzer was a John, right? I mean, it would just, it kind of is what it is. Um, but I think even knowing how people feel about the issue, hearing it over and over and over again, Cindy Adams, um, who I'm not particularly a huge fan of anyway, but I mean, who'd done, had done a piece and, and compared um, hiring, hiring a woman as similar, for, for a wife as similar to Chinese food, that it's less work for mother. Um, I mean, just that, and that's, you know, and, and so, I mean, there were women, right? I mean, you know, who were saying some pretty horrendous things. They were, you know, very vocal. And we, we got invited to be on a lot of different kind of panels, and, and I think the, the tone and, and, and the way it was being sensationalized actually led me to turn down a lot of stuff that week because it was, you know, I mean, you're going up against, you've got Heidi Fleisch, you've got Tracy Kwan, you've got, you know, some folks who are really very kind of established in the in the pro-sex work movement. And that was what people wanted to hear that week, that there's that kind of, you know, that higher tier um, of, of sex work and that there's escort agencies that are so glamorous and so wonderful. Um, and that, you know, these girls just kind of want it or these women kind of want it. I think it, was, I think it was really, really challenging. I think it did, you know, unfortunately a lot of harm and I don't think there were a lot of alternate voices. Um, out there and the media didn't want those alternate voices which became very clear as we were doing like pre-interview stuff um, that they kept kind of trying to channel it into what they wanted to hear um, and, I, and I think that's one of the the difficulties in this movement and Taina was talking as I walked in about kind of the survivor network and survivor movements and I think what the pro sex industry movement has been very good at is ensuring that folks who have experiences within the sex industry are often front and center at the discussions. I think the abolitionist movement, the anti-trafficking movement, the anti-commercial sexual exploitation of children movement, like that movement hasn't been as good at ensuring that survivors are kind of at the forefront and ensuring that those roles and are not token roles but kind of legitimate roles and ensuring that kind of those voices um, are really heard and so and and it, obviously there is a different level of validity there um, so I mean I think as we move forward that's something that we have to kind of get better at figure out ways to make sure that it's safe and supportive um, for survivors to come forward and not allow you know kind of the media to dominate that conversation or allow the the, the kind of pro-sex industry movement to, to kind of take the lead on that yeah, Equality Now had been working with Spitzer for about eight years on these issues of sex trafficking and, and prostitution. So it was a very, it was a huge sting to us. I mean, I think when we go uh, meet with legislators, senators, state, federal, mm -hmm. whatever, we sometimes we leave the meetings and say, he's definitely on the list. Um, Spitzer was never one of those because not only was he so active on the sex tourism front, but also he's the one who drafted the New York State Human Trafficking Law, which is the strongest anti-trafficking law in the country. And we were actually waiting for him to be uh, um, elected as governor because after three years of trying to get uh, a human trafficking law in New York, we knew he was going to be the only one who, would, who could help us pass the law. Um, having said that, um, I think, you know, just to echo what Rachel said during the whole Spitzer uh, debacle, it was really um, a sex industry red carpet fest the whole week. I mean, from Anderson Cooper on down. And if you listen to uh, Kristen or Ashley or, or, you know, the number of names she, she uses, which is also an indication of who she is, I mean, she is sort of the prototype of a, of a sexually exploited woman in the sex trade, homeless, uh, raped, uh, probably sexually abused. Um, and so when you are really at your lowest, then you have a pimp come in and say, I've just got the job for you. And so I think that's also, mm -hmm. we're talking about a paradigm shift here. We're talking about a national and international paradigm shift that the whole notion of consent, I think, feminists and, and, the, and society at large really has to think about what consent means. It's the same 
term that was used in the domestic violence movement. Uh, she stayed there because she wanted to. She didn't, you know, she didn't like to be beaten. She, she would have left. It's the same uh, argument that we, we heard in, in the rape, uh, uh, in the anti-rape movement. And so, and it continues in, in prostitution. And so I think that that was the, the sad <laughs> aspect. And also I think it's, it's really um, a wake up call for us to, as, as advocates, to say we need to regroup and find out what kind of language we need to create to communicate the harm of the sex trade on, mm. on, on women and that it, this is not a pretty woman, speaking of the film, you know, situation at all, so. In the <coughs> sexual harassment law, for instance, we tried to, instead of speaking about consent, it uses the word welcome. Mm -hmm. You know, was the sexual overture or attention welcome? And that in itself is a consciousness change. Hi, uh, first I wanna thank Rachel for talking so personally because I think a lot of people will hear these very high statistics about sexual abuse and they'll just see a number when survivors come out and talk about their story. It really puts a face on it where it's not just a number of things happening to a number of people. It's your sisters, your daughters, your mothers, everybody. So, so thank you for that. But uh, I wanted to ask what, um, what are the different sort of situations with um, metropolitan sort of uh, sex trafficking situations versus rural, and uh, what are the different demands of those in trying to combat them? Rachel, do you want to um, You want to just, I, I, I guess, <coughs> so just kind of comparing what's happening on an mm -hmm. urban level to what's happening kind of rurally, right? I, I mean, look, I'll say um, my agency is in central Harlem. I live in the South Bronx. My expertise is definitely around um, urban as opposed to as opposed to rural. What uh, what we have seen though, you know, over the last few years is, I, I mean, and, and we do know, and, and and I'll say we do know that the the primary areas for commercial sexual exploitation of tra and trafficking of, of children and women um, do tend to be in large urban areas, right? Because there are New York, for example, has a, a huge sex industry huge existing adult sex industry. So anytime that you wanna, you know, kind of channel children into that um, or, or traffic women into, you know, I mean, the, 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 the demand is already there, the demand has already been created. Um, if you add in kind of poverty, and I mean, you can look at, for example, in, in New York, if you look at stats of uh, arrests, both on a juvenile and an adult level, not for, not for prostitution, but just kind of across the board, um, arrests generally happen particularly for juveniles in one of six different communities in New York City, right? And so those six different communities, and I mean, we could all take a guess where those are, um, but those six communities generally um, have, you know, incredibly high rates of poverty. The South Bronx, where Hunts Point is located at, and Hunts Point is still one of the most notorious and active tracks, um, areas for, for street prostitution in the city um, is located in the poorest congressional district in the country um, still. So I mean, you know, those kind of things mirror each other. Um, you know, the, the poverty and the kind of abandonment of entire communities and, you know, the, the devastation that left many communities in New York just kind of, you know, like war zones. Um, in the in the early 80s and towards the the beginning of the 90s, have left an, an entire generation of kids who are really really vulnerable. Um, in rural areas, definitely, we see the poverty um, being a, a, a large issue. We know the areas, and this kind of cuts across the board, areas where there are transient males. Um, you know, and that's been documented. So, you know, f in, in New York City, that might be areas where there are lots of truck drivers, i.e. Hunts Point, industrial areas like that. In rural areas, um, you know, we know that there are truck routes that go through many of these areas. There is, and it, it's strange, I mean, you go to kind of somewhere, I don't know, random in the Midwest, I won't offend anybody from the Midwest, but some bit, somewhere in the Midwest, and it's kind of dead for miles, right? And you've got just, you know, miles and miles and miles of kind of nothing, and then there's like a strip club and then like a Wendy's and then like a truck stop, right? Like there's that kind of, and so we know that those <coughs> kind of areas 
um, have, uh, have sprung up throughout the country and, and we know a lot of times those are underage kids, those are um, women who've been trafficked in those areas. We know that the internet has changed the face of sexual exploitation. Um, I can be anywhere now and I can buy a kid. I don't need to be in a, you know, a, a, you know cosmopolitan area. I can be, you know, as long as I've got a laptop, you know, and we know that, that pimps and traffickers bring their children and their women to various areas kind of, you know, where, the, where they feel like there's going to be demand. So, I mean, I, I don't know if that really answers the question, um, but those are just some of the different dynamics that we've seen. I guess I have two questions. One is, is there a legal differentiate be, differentiation between prostitution and trafficking? And secondly, speak more to the new abolitionists and what kind of campaigns and efforts are going on to reach the American public in this particular instance so that people are more aware of the problem and less naive about it. And secondly, changes in legislation, and I guess also directing interventions uh, on the demand side. Uh, how many hours do you have? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that's the crux of uh, the debate that is happening within the human rights, women's rights community is the link between sex trafficking and prostitution. Um, some of us believe that they, they should be delinked, that there is sex trafficking and it looks a certain way, which would be what the definition of the, the current federal law is, which is forced fraud coercion. <laughs> so unless a woman can prove that there is a gun to her head at all times or that she's chained to a radiator, it's not really sex trafficking. And then there are others who believe, like, like we do, um, that the reason why women are trafficked in the sex trade is for purposes of prostitution. And if there were no prostitution, there would be no sex trafficking. So you cannot delink both. Um, and slavery in women does not look like antebellum slavery. You don't need, once the force fraud coercion occurs at the onset of the, of, of the trafficking. Um, he's waving, am I, we doing something? No? <laughs> um, so that, let's say, if, uh, since, since we work on international issues, let's say a young woman from the Ukraine sees an ad in the paper um, for a babysitting job, she winds up here at JFK, babysitting job is no longer available, but now you are indebted for your travel and uh, for your... Uh, room and board, and so the woman is raped. Well, she's seasoned, quote unquote, so she'll be raped, uh, probably given drugs, beaten, etc. So that when there is a, a, a brothel raid three months after that, six months after that, a year after that, is she still a trafficking victim? We would say yes, because she was really trafficked for purposes of prostitution. But law enforcement here in New York City would say, you know what, she's just another hooker on the street. You know, and won't ask the, the proper questions. And so that's why it's really uh, critical to, to not, not <laughs> delink both. Um, in terms of legislation, again, as I mentioned, the state, um, the, the state human trafficking law is the strongest law in that there's a higher penalty for those who patronize uh, prostitution than those in prostitution. Unfortunately, we would have loved to see a total decriminalization of people in prostitution, but again, that's probably for another decade, uh, if we're lucky. Um, but nevertheless, I think it, it's starting to open the conversation about you know, the gender inequality of, of the situation. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of prosecutions and prostitution, where we actually asked a law firm to look at, um, to see whether anyone would have standing, for instance, somebody, uh, Gems, or another person would have standing to sue either the New York City police or, or another city agency in terms of discrimination and prosecution. Um, I don't know what the statistics are here in, in the US, but they, they vary from state to state for anywhere between, for every woman that's arrested, you'll have four men or eight men who are arrested. And so there's a huge discrepancy in the law.
Um, and it, it's mostly, prostitution is mostly illegal in the US except for a few counties in, in Nevada. So that's basically the, the, the framework of, of the law. We're, we're nowhere close, although again, w the Wilberforce Act, and I'll just <coughs> highlight the major, um, some of the interesting changes I think that will help us, even though we didn't get what we wanted, is one is that um, now the um, Attorney General will mandate reports from each state to break down the number of arrests uh, whether it's the, the victims or pimps or, or the so-called Johns. And so that will help us to see the discrimination pattern. Uh, another provision that will be helpful is what they call the look back provision, whereby um, if, uh, if um <clears throat> a pimp is arrested or if, if a victim is arrested, for instance, and she's <coughs> over 18, the prosecutor will have to look back to see at what point she was uh, entered into the sex trade, and if she was under 18 at the time of inception, then the force fraud coercion uh, threshold um, disappears, which is which is very very helpful. And so we're we're moving toward um, more of a demand looking country, but mm -hmm. it's the resistance is enormous. Mm -hmm. I, I would I would lie if I didn't tell you that the resistance at the tippy tippy top is fierce. The DC madam had 20,000 names of, of men working in Washington DC and <coughs> when we asked what those names were, and I believe CNN has a list of those names, they said it was not newsworthy. The only person who was caught was uh, Mr. Tobias, who was head of USAID at the time and also you know, wasn't necessarily sympathetic to, to our vision of, of things and happened to be on the list and resigned. So again, I think the resistance is fear, so. And, and you asked about the new abolitionists. Uh, I think mainly the new abolitionists are trying to raise consciousness. You know, if you so choose, you will be a new abolitionist when you leave this room today. Uh, and the, the, um, the heroes of the new abolitionist movement are the survivors who come forward and tell stories and what we can do is offer support uh, to to those stories, um, it's um, you know it, it, those of us who are familiar with uh, movements of all kinds. This is the way it goes, right? First, you change consciousness, uh, and uh, that of course never stops. But at least that gets to a critical mass of consciousness, and then you begin to be able to. Uh, take steps forward uh, that have to do with the systems themselves and how people are treated, and I would say we are really just at, just at the beginning of that. But the very fact that I, I would say it's only a couple of years that people have been calling themselves new aboli abolitionists, don't you think? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, very importantly, there are groups, mainly women's movement groups, as far as I can see, around the world, from Zambia to Nepal to Ghana to um, the city of Minneapolis, uh, and that woman is trying to start one in Las Vegas. There are all these groups who are at least places where the women, with, the women can go if they do escape. Uh, in, in some places, in India, for instance, it's more elaborate than that as an effort. They actually stage raids on the brothels. Uh, they send uh, men in with cameras to show that there are children and underage people, that there are all kinds of practices of brutality going on. Then they stage raids, which was in the beginning extremely controversial. Uh, and now is uh, best practices, you know, with many of the areas with the police in, in India. They offer a kind of halfway house, a safe house. I mean, it's, it's not at all realistic to expect that a woman can emerge uh, with what under any other circumstances w w would be called the Stockholm Syndrome you know, and immediately testify against her, uh, in the people who have been imprisoning her. So they, they offer places where women can stay together, can begin to speak freely, can gain confidence, uh, and if they wish, also receive uh, training and other ways of, of making a living. So, you know, I've, they may 
and, and it's interesting because they're training them in, in uh, professions that are not uh, hairdressing and sewing, you know, they're doing, <laughs> they're becoming mechanics and making furniture and so on, and actually, you know, so they can, they can make a living and, and establishing <coughs> schools for their children. So, you know, it, it ranges, the new abolitionists, I would say, range from, from consciousness to starting uh, very physical rescue operations and halfway houses and so on where uh, it's possible to, to go. However, if we visualize this whole thing as a river, I think we are still very much standing on the side of the river trying to pluck out people who are drowning. We have not yet gone to the head of the river to keep people from falling in. It's not, not anywhere near that. Rachel, um, where have you shown your movie? Did you just finish it? No, we finished it. It actually started airing um, last year. We premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival. Ah. So we've done about a year's worth of film festivals oh, everywhere okay. from Jackson Hole to Warsaw to um, Edinburgh, etc. So, I mean, that's been kind of the festival circuit. Okay. It just came out on Showtime. We just had our television broadcast premiere on Thursday evening. Um, and so it will be available, okay, shameless plug, it's gonna be available um, on Showtime for the next month on demand till January 8th. Okay. One of the things we were encouraging folks to do has been to sign up for a screening party. Yeah. Um, and so we had a lot of people the night of the premiere, even this weekend, who've signed up on our website um, and have invited 10, 15 friends over, some wine, some cheese, thrown in the movie um, and then began to have a discussion about what that means. And I, I mean, I, you know, I'm obviously biased. We produced the movie, co-produced the movie, you know, put a lot of, of effort into it. But I'll say, I mean, everywhere that we've gone with this film, we have seen people's minds change about <coughs> this issue. Um, and so, you know, over the next year or two, I mean, the goal is to get it into detention centers and group homes, into mm -hmm. hospitals, into, I mean, everywhere, you know, churches and synagogues and women's groups and colleges. And I mean, everywhere that anybody mm -hmm. will screen it, you know, they can. Um, and so I think this hopefully will have a long shelf life. I'll say as I was parking right here on, on Washington Avenue kind of, flustered because I'd gotten lost, which is a sad story, and, and was running late and was like, oh God. Um, and I needed some quarters to, to feed the meter and I ran into the store and I said, can I get some quarters with some change? And this guy was behind um, me and he said, you're, you're on TV, you're, you're in a TV show. And I was like, no, because I'm, I'm not even thinking about it, I'm kind of like running. And he came out and he was like, yeah, Showtime, a couple of nights ago. He was like, you run an agency or something, right? And I was like, yeah, and I was like, what did you think? Because he was like this big burly dude. And I was like, what did you think? And he was like, it's pretty moving. I never knew. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I was like, oh, you recognize me? It's very odd, but um, he said it was the accent that gave it away. But, and he said, you know, I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna tell my wife. And I said, look, tell your family members, anybody who's got showtime. I mean, and that's, you know, in addition to the folks who, you know, over the last few days we've had, we've had emails from folks who are still in the life and really struggling, from survivors who've never had an opportunity to talk about it, um, from parents whose kids are, you know, missing, um, and then just from average people who are like, wow, I just happened to flick on the TV, and never had, I'd never thought about it in this context, I didn't know it was happening here. So I mean, I encourage, you know, it'll be available for purchase um, after the 8th. I encourage folks to go on our website um, and use it as much as you can. I mean, invite folks to, to see mm -hmm. it, forward the link on. Um, you know, we really, really want to make sure that this gets out as far and wide as possible um, and begins to change mm -hmm. the conversation around this. Did have you, you have your, your website? Pro I'm sorry, sorry www.gems-girls.org, that's G-E-M-S-girls.org. And there's a big link that says movie. Have you approached the Human Rights Watch Film Festival here in New York City? Um, we actually did. I don't know if we're, we've um, heard back from them. And I see people nodding, so I think that means maybe there's a connection. But um, we, ha we did approach them. I mean, we're, you know, anywhere that will take us right now, we are totally shameless. Well, I, I, I will just ask if we have a final word or two. Um, 
Because I think, you know, each of us can contribute in, in, in a way, I mean, you know, we can each watch this in our living rooms and discuss it and, you know, there are many obvious things, but I see there are lots of distinguished academics here too and we need uh, research, uh, I mean, we know that body invasion is much more traumatic than even uh, body assault, you know, than external thing. Uh, and this is just in the nascent stage of, of research. The people who seem to understand it most among my correspondents are men in prison who have been raped in prison and who say, okay, now I get it, body invasion, you know, what takes place inside your body is even worse than getting, or even more traumatic and long lasting and so on. So, you know, there, there are many ways that you can uh, contribute uh, that you know and we don't. Uh, but if you let us know, we'll try to help. Oh, I just, I, I'd like to echo that and just say, I mean, I think sometimes we think about movements and, and obviously, I mean, you know, always honored to um, get to be anywhere near um, the wonderful Gloria Steinem and recognize and obviously, you know, her leadership, um, you know, over the years and over the decades, really. Um, and I think sometimes, though, we can feel like intimidated um, by kind of leadership in movements and think, you know, it's, you know, these kind of name people or these people who really articulate and get up and do these really amazing things. And, and every movement needs folks like that. Um, and I'm so, you know, happy that, that Gloria's really kind of, you know, made such a stand on this issue. But ultimately, you know, the, the way that things have changed in our country and, you know, you know, across the world through social justice issues has been individuals. It hasn't necessarily been about charismatic leaders. And you know, it just in the last six weeks or so, we saw real change happen in our country. And obviously while there is leadership around that, um, and very clear kind of defined leadership, it took everybody and it took individuals and it took my kids who are 18, 19, voting for the first time up in Harlem and really excited and wearing their buttons. I mean, it, t it took kind of everyone. And so I think around this issue, um, it can get overwhelming and sometimes it can be really tough to think about Oh my God, people being enslaved, you know, the, the rape, the assault, the devastation. And sometimes we can get so overwhelmed that we get paralyzed. And so I think it's really breaking that down and saying, yeah, what specifically can I do? So if the most I do this week, which is huge, is talk to 10 people about this conversation that I heard. If I email, you know, everybody on my Facebook page and say, here's three things I learned today. Here's a couple of links you should go check out. Um, those, those are really manageable, <coughs> doable things. Um, and invite, you know, the next time that there's a panel, invite two people, particularly invite two men that you know, two men in your life. Um, a lot of times we're uncomfortable talking with the men in our lives about have you ever paid for sex? Um, have you ever been to a strip club? What do you, what do you think those, those women are doing? What do you think they're thinking? Those are important conversations that we could be having. Um, and so I just really encourage everyone to think very specifically about what are those, you know, really concrete action steps that you can take within the next week, over the next few months, and recognize how important that is to the overall movement. Um, I, I would echo that. I, I think you, do, you don't have to dedicate your life to human rights in order to make a difference. I mean, we see that every single day. Taking action can mean uh, sending a fax, writing a letter, picking up the phone. Um, if you go on equalitynow.org, we've got two ongoing actions. One, we've been trying to shut down GNF sex tours in Texas for about four years. The Attorney General's office has refused to look at it. And the other is India is also, well, our partners in India are also struggling with, with a law trying to criminalize buyers um, in their trafficking law. So those are easy letters to, to send. And again, as Rachel said, I think uh, just speaking about it, raising awareness about this issue will, will go a very, very long way. And just the fact that you're here uh, resonates so profoundly, not, not just here in Brooklyn, but, but around the world too. Liz. Okay, well, I'd like to thank Gloria, thank Rachel, and thank Tiana for a wonderful panel. Thank you very much. Yes, you will have an opportunity for more questions. If you would like to come up to the fourth floor, join us for some wine at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. Take a look at the dinner party, have some good conversation, burning down the house. Our brand new exhibition is up, Fertile Goddess. 
and um, hope to see you up there. It's just an elevator ride away. Tomorrow, uh, Brooklyn-born writer Jennifer Cody Epstein is going to be reading from her uh, book, The Painter from Shanghai. I'm looking very much forward to that in the forum. I wish you all a very happy holiday, a healthy new year, a productive new year, and peace and love and much needed change in the new year. Amen. Thank you.